So exactly how is that going to play in the eternal state, given what we know about people now? And I'm going to obviously be speculating. It isn't a happy answer. Basically, the people who will be at the most bottom of heaven society are those who knew better but didn't capitalize on it. In other words, if you had a lot of exposure to the Bible and you knew it well, but you still opted for the religious life, the good works and all the rest of it, you go to the bottom because you're more, to more has been given, more is expected. And, you know, for us as church in general, more has been given, so more is expected. So the, the bottom for us even though we're all body, the bottom for us is a whole lot lower than the bottom for somebody else. We've been given a higher privilege, a higher spiritual life. It's a lot easier in certain ways because all you do is learn and live on Bible and you determine before the Lord how that works. That's Romans 13 through 15. You don't have a cookie cutter spiritual life like they did in the Old Testament. And if you aren't determining by learning and living on Bible what that life is for you, then you are more responsible than somebody who didn't have that as an option. I hope you get that. See, if a person is rich and he doesn't do with his wealth what he ought to do, He's more responsible than someone who was poor and had no wealth to have any issue to do anything about. Okay, those are justice issues and very much more here. So in other words, if I flunk, and I still can, if I get cattywampus with God, I stop using 1 John 1 9, I stop growing spiritually, then I'm going to go to the bottom of heaven's society. Because look how much I knew and then didn't finish the course so you see how just that is okay so the ones at the bottom are the ones who could have grown the fastest or the most and didn't now unfortunately that's going to mean a whole lot of people that in this world we respect like the pastors the teachers the popes all those people most of them are not growing spiritually you can tell by what they say So they're at the bottom. They are the ones that by office were slated to be the kings. By office. See, it's a spiritual gift to be a pastor teacher. It's a spiritual gift to, you know, be able to run a lexicon. It's a spiritual gift to be in a position where you can actually be elected pope. And you didn't grow spiritually. Which of course, you know, the denominations are satanic. So for you to rise in your denomination means you have to be more satanic than the other people in it. So you go to the more to the bottom of heaven's kingdom. That's, that's you know, anti-Semites. We'll be down at the bottom somewhere, but not quite as bottom. All the people in the King James Onlyism, uh, Catholic, Catholicism, Calvinism, JW, SDA, even if they believed in Christ, they're saved, but they're going to be at the bottom of heaven's society, but not at the very bottom. That's reserved for like the people who got the office and were trained in Bible and didn't, didn't grow with it. See, you can know Bible backwards and not grow spiritually. I mean, think about that. You can know a lot of things, and yet it doesn't gel. You can spout it off. You can abuse it. You can use it as a weapon to say how good you are. That doesn't mean that you actually know what you're talking about. I see that all the time with lawyers. They know the law backwards and frontwards, and yet they know nothing. Absolutely nothing. 
And the same thing is true for a lot of other positions in life. Politicians are a good example. There's only one politician running for president who actually knows what he's talking about. Possibly two. And it's his own real knowledge. Everybody else is just, I don't know, it's like they're reading lines. They don't really have any leadership. They don't have any understanding. There's possibly three out of all the GOP candidates. There's nothing, nobody in the, in the Democratic Party who knows what he's talking about. They're just out for power and they're living on some kind of Pollyanna idea. At best. The nicest thing I can say about him. Including the guy who's in president right now. He has no idea. None. Zero. Or if he does, he doesn't know how to translate it into viable political action. He screwed it up every time. He doesn't he didn't understand what Bush was doing. He understood some of it though. And then, I don't know, his brain just went off. The whole purpose of the Bush administration, what GW had done, was unlike everybody else, he said, you know what, if we don't get rid of this problem, it's going to keep on coming back at us. And he told everybody, let's bring the war to them. We don't wait to get attacked again. We bring the war to them, which means a permanent status in the Middle East. That's the only way to solve this problem. It really is. And by the way, then you're right there next to Israel so you can help her. Now, even the Israelis didn't understand that. I don't know if Bibi did, but the Israelis surely did not. And it has so many genius elements to it. I'm so proud of GW for doing that. But see, that's what a real spiritual person does. I'm not saying that GW is spiritual. He might be. I don't know. He's grown a lot since he was in office, that's for sure. But a spiritual person can see all of the elements and put them together. Whereas somebody who's just trained in the words and spitting out the words is just like a little parrot, a martinet. And that's really what most of the people in Christianity are. They're little parrots and martinets. They just spit information back. They don't understand it. And so they're not growing spiritually, so they're at the bottom of society. And the bottom most are going to be those who had the office of explaining the word. And didn't do it. That's speculation on my part, but it makes sense. Next bottom most will be all the anti-Semites. And whole denominations are anti-Semitic. And the people don't even know it. Dominionism. Ted Cruz thinks he's pro-Israel. But the sect of Christianity his dad belongs to, and he's real tight with his dad, so I have to presume that he believes in it too, is called dominionism. Dominionism is anti-Semitic. Dominionism believes that there's no future place for the nation Israel in history, despite what the Bible says. The Bible very clearly says Israel is queen of the nations in the, in the millennium. But Dominionism denies there even is a millennium. Dominionism maintains that when we make everybody Christian, not necessarily everybody, but enough, then Christ will return because we've Christianized the world. That, that's not even in the Bible. You have to be reading it upside down to think that. But dominionism is totally anti-Semitic, so nothing makes sense to an anti-Semite. I mean, only senseless things make sense to an anti-Semite. Anything to cut out the Jews. So Ted Cruz thinks he's pro-Israel so much that he, he gets real snotty with a group of Israelis who are Christians. But his dad is involved in a sect, which I have to presume Ted is too, that, you know, is anti-Semitic at the core. Denies Israel a future role in history. All replacement theology is based on, or all dominionism is, is based on, replacement theology. Replacement theology says the church replaced Israel. So all the promises that were supposed to go to Israel go to church instead. Well, that's cutting Israel out. That's anti-Semitic. Period. And it's totally anti-Bible, of course. 
Okay, so anti-Semitics are next bottom on the rung. So at the very bottom are all the false teachers. Just below them, or just above them, are the anti-Semitics, which is millions upon millions upon millions of Christians. At least in this generation. Whole denominations are anti-Semitic. It doesn't matter that you don't know. A crime is still a crime. You, whether you, if did you commit the crime, that you didn't know it was a crime, well, too bad. It's still a crime. You committed it. And people, their whole lives remain that way. And in the 1950s, this was extremely common. Extremely. I'm of the generation. I'm. Uh, what would you call me? I guess you could say I'm at the tail end of the flower children generation. My my people my age went to Vietnam to fight. Okay? And we all looked at our parents who were almost universally anti Semitic. Any any black, any Hispanic, any Semitic. They're all, you know, the white racists who are complaining today, the white racists who all are, you know, shouting rah rah Donald Trump. Is Donald Trump a racist? I don't know. I kinda doubt it. Maybe he used to be, but he's not now. But the people supporting him sure are. And oh, non-whites are invading the United States, and non-whites are threatening the existence of the United Who said the United States was supposed to be a white nation in the first place? What the fuck does it matter, excuse my French, if your skin is white? Who cares? It's what's inside your soul that matters, not what's outside on your skin. Hello? And are there a lot of stupid black people? You bet. There's a whole lot of stupid white people, too. Are there a lot of stupid Hispanics? You bet. Are there a lot of stupid Asians? You bet. And there are a lot of smart ones in every color of the spectrum. Because there are nasty people and there are nice people. Because there are smart people and there are dumb people. Because there are cockroach people and there are non-cockroach people. And all the cockroach people are part of the field that God bought for the treasure of the few who are producing 30-fold, 60-fold, 100-fold of his thinking, which has no color. So what does it matter what color skin they got? It's skin. It's not your soul. It's skin. It's part of the body. The body's a house you walk in. God made each human being. The soul is the real you, not your skin. So you see how many cockroach people? Anti-Semitic, anti-Hispanic, anti-black, anti-anything. Oh, white supremacy baloney. The only thing that made us white supreme was not our skin, dummy. It was because we got Bible doctrine. And so anywhere Bible doctrine resides, you become superior as a result of having it. And that's what's happening now in India, in China, in Africa, and in Latin America. There is a huge growth in Indonesia even, which is a Muslim country. There's a huge growth, a huge not being like in numbers. Okay, because see, if it's 1%, hundredfold, you don't need many. But huge relative to the growth in the past. There's a huge growth of interest in the Bible, in God. Apart from politics, just wanting to know Him. So the whole field of the whole world, He bought... 2,000 years ago, and it's now coming to a kind of sprouting. And most of that sprouting is not occurring in Europe. It's not occurring in the United States. Because all the whites are busy priding themselves on being white, when that wasn't what made you good in the first place, dummy. It was that you stopped worshipping trees and painting your body blue, and instead you started reading the Bible. Easter means a star, east star in German. The star that rises in the east in the morning. Sun rises in the east and sets in the west. Venus, planet Venus looks like a star. It shows up early in the morning. And then on Easter they were waiting for that star because that would tell them it was dawn. 
And then that way they would, re, you know, sort of associate with Christ rising at dawn. He might have risen before dawn, but he did rise after sunset the previous day because the Jewish day starts at sunset. sunset. And they knew that. So that's why they called it Easter. It has nothing to do with some pagan god. But, you know, if you don't do your study in languages, you don't know that. So all these people who are all hung up on their race are likely to be anti-Semitic or anti-somebody else's color. You know, blacks are racist too, and a certain amount of them, a certain number of them. Some Hispanics are racist also, not too many. Some Asians are anti some other Asian race. Some Africans are anti some other African race. Whoop-de-doo. Those are all puerile people. And if you're real violent, you know, you're like strongly anti somebody else's race, then you're, you're a cockroach. So you're right there at the bottom of heaven's society, even if saved. Okay, and then maybe lower between the anti-Semite and the false teachers are all the lukewarm believers. Hail fellow, well met. The value of being a Christian means you're doing a lot of good deeds and you go to church on Sunday and you dress in your Sunday best and you smile at the pastor and he shakes your hand when you leave and he's lukewarm and you're lukewarm and baby, you're going to be at the bottom of society. How far down at the bottom? I don't know. But, but, but low. Really low. Because you're lukewarm. And Christ even said that. I'll spit you out of my mouth. And he's making a joke there because Laodicea was a party town. And in a party town, the number one thing you needed was a vomitorium. So you could eat and eat and eat and eat and eat. And then you drank the Laodicean water, which was lukewarm. And therefore you, you threw up. And then you could go back to eating again. Because the stomach is only going to hold so much food. And if you vomited it back up, of course, then you didn't you know, gain weight either. Vomitoriums were very important in Rome, especially in party towns. Laodicea was a party town. So Christ says, you know what? If you don't straighten up and fly right, you don't get, get back with the spiritual life, I'm going to throw you up. Which is really funny because the idea of eating the word is what, you know, Jeremiah talked about. I've eaten your words and, and that's another way of saying I believe them. So if you eat it and throw up, it means that you used to believe and now you don't. So he's mimicking their own attitude toward him. They used to believe in him and now they're throwing him up, so he's going to throw them up. Very clever. So, the lukewarm. Okay, now how many Christians are left? All those people being at the bottom? We're talking about 90% of Christianity now at the bottom. Where's the middle class? Not much. So over time then, in the heavenly state, in the eternal state, hopefully they'll become a middle class. By the top class, sending their Bible doctrine knowledge that they learned while they were down here, living it out, and then the hoi polloi watching how the upper classes live just like they do down here. When you, when, that's how people learn down here. This is how you really uh, progress a society. You have an upper class that's very public. There everybody sees. And all the, they've, they've all known this throughout history. They all have lived this way. You're, you're the upper class. You're very public. You're kind of ostentatious about your standards and your lifestyle and who's who and blah blah and everybody watches and then they want to ape you now they have no idea of the nobility of soul that's going on inside but they can see the outer behaviors and the outer functions and the outer dress and the outer food and the outer clothing and blah 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 blah, blah. and they ape all of that and they learn based on aping that. And they start to learn the inner soul stuff from the outer aping. That's how it's happened throughout history, even down here. That's how it will continue to happen up there. 
because they could have known God and said no. Bible was just a thing to thump or a thing to trump somebody with. Really knowing God didn't matter to them. Okay. So in heaven, they're getting what they want. They're at the bottom of heavenly society. They wanted to be petty and small and works-oriented and, and outer-oriented and all the rest of it. Okay, they're getting that. And you'll be at the top, and you'll have all the money, and you'll have all the fame and the popularity, and they'll be watching you every minute to ape you. And that's how they'll learn him, by aping you. It's unfortunately a really small and slow and annoying system because then you you have to end up being something of a peacock. And it'll be your kingdom so you can control how much of that you're willing to do. But you will do it because this is their this is their chosen mechanism of learning. This is how they choose to live. So if you want to communicate with them and send information about him to them, this is the only way they're willing to learn it. See, it's not wrong. It's not a sin. It is a choice, and it is a limitation. And freedom is righteousness. This is part about the story I really hate. Because what I'm telling you, I'm thinking to myself while I'm talking sometimes, God, I have to be a peacock forever? This is what God considers heaven? But look at what Christ is. He's the ultimate peacock. And we watch him, don't we? We pour over every little detail about what he did when he was 5 or 12 or 30, 33. We pour it over. We've been pouring over it for, for centuries now. And it's always useful and helpful to do so. If he wasn't willing to be on stage, then what could we learn? So that's how it goes. You're going to be your representative of Christ. He's, the, he's king of kings. You're one of the kings he's king over. So you have to be a mini Christ to your kingdom. And this is how they'll learn from you. See how integrated all that is? A whole integration, a function, the, the diagonal line going all the way down to the lowest in your kingdom. You have to be a peacock. You'll have to dress in the nice clothes and have, I, when I think about this, I just want to throw up. Dress in the nice clothes, have the little, the rituals or the, the ceremonies and the parades and all that because that's what the people can identify with. And they'll learn something about him through it. And that's what I want. But you can't just, you can't just give the information out direct. It's like with children, okay? If you're a first grade teacher, you, you're maybe 30. I mean, typical teacher, I, re I remember, was about 30, was female. And then the rest of us were what? Six years old. First grade, six years old. Teacher can't talk to us in her own adult language. She has to simplify and talk it down and give us little things to do like finger painting or A, B, C, D, E, F, G and practicing handwriting. You know, see John, see Dick, see Jane. You have to be real simple with those kids. They don't, they, they don't have a vocabulary even. Okay, so you have to teach them the vocabulary. Well, as king to your subjects who could have learned and didn't, you're going to have to go all the way down to kindergarten level. And that means them watching you and every word you say and every movement of your hand, and they will learn something. And that's the reason to do those things. That's the only, as far as I'm concerned, as opinion now. The only justification for having the wealth and the fancy clothes and the fancy, if we eat food, the fancy food, the fancy, you know, meetings and all that garbage that you see royalty go through now. 
The only reason for having that is so since the others will only learn by watching the what I consider shallow stuff. If that's the way they'll learn, better they should learn something. And if I have to wear that junk and strut around and use fancy whatever language or whatever it is I got to do, so they will learn something about him, then I'll do that. You know that's how the Catholic Church actually got started. That was why they started doing that stuff. Because the people wouldn't learn unless they put on, you know, pony show. That's how they developed the surplus and the funky clothing and the incense and the, the, the chanting and all the things that they do. And whether it's Greek Orthodox, Russian Orthodox or Roman Catholic. That's how they started it. They did it for the masses. That's why they call it mass. They did it for the masses. Because the masses wanted to ooh and ah over the pageantry of it. And they would get some vague sense of God through the pageantry of it. And then they gradually developed the actual words of the Mass with snippets of Scripture, hoping that at least the Masses would remember it. Not that they'd understand, but at least could say the words. Because people weren't interested in the actual Bible. And of course, the flip side of that was is they, they, the, the guys who developed all this got a lot of power out of it, and they came to like the fact that they were higher than the masses. So then they didn't want to teach them Bible. And of course, that, that particular problem has persisted to this day. Catholics are renowned for being totally uneducated in Scripture. But they wouldn't know the Bible if it bit them. Calvinists are a little bit better at knowing Bible, but they don't understand it. They know it, but they don't understand it. And that's the way it goes. So here you are. You're the king. You want them to know his thinking. You don't want to live if you can't see his thinking. But they don't know his thinking, and it bothers them. And their whole method of wanting to learn a thing. This is a sad thing about people. They don't want to learn the content unless they like the person. That's what's so sick about humans. The most sick thing about humans is nobody, unless they like you, what you say nobody cares to know. They, it, it's like they're saying, well, the truth or facts or information is less important than the one saying it. Okay, but a dog could, re if a dog could talk and a dog recited the gospel, the gospel would still be 100% divine and valid. It doesn't matter that a dog is saying it. Balaam's ass talked scripture. Scripture is still just as valid. It doesn't matter that an ass said it. So if you're saying scripture, or you got something important that's true about scripture that you're saying, that's what matters, not the fact that it's you saying it. But people are so disgusting that they don't care about the content. They don't care if it's scripture even. What they care about is do I respect or like or am attracted to the person who says it. And then no matter what the person says, they'll buy it because they like the person. So truth does not matter to the human race at all. They care about who's mouthing it. And if they like who's mouthing it, then whatever the person mouths, they will buy into. So the human race hates God, hates truth, hates everything, just like the Bible says it does. The heart of, what was it? The heart of man is deceitful and desperately wicked. Who can know it? That's in uh, Jeremiah, should be in Lamentations. Somewhere around 3, Lamentations 3. I'll have to go look it up. He threw that at me while I was talking. Man is disgusting. Okay, now when we're dead, we're still human. We're still disgusting. We're not sitting anymore. But we will still, our choice of relating is going to be based on the person before the truth. The truth matters less than the person. 
Okay, God accommodates that. Because that's a free choice. It's not that the truth doesn't matter because you're not going to be sinning anymore. But it's got a lower importance to the bulk of humanity in heaven than the person who says it. That person's mm -hmm. going to be you. Anything coming out of your mouth, everybody's going to hang on. Everything you do, everything you say, you live in this glass house forever. And the reason why you're willing to do that is because every moment, every moment, every movement, everything you do is going to be related to Bible doctrine. That's why it's good to start that practice now. While you're still in this body. When you write an email, when you go to the bathroom, when you go to the refrigerator, can you associate it with Bible doctrine? Because you're already in a glass house right now. You're living before God, the whole of heaven sees you. I don't know who's stopping by to watch you make your breakfast choice of the day, but count on it, you're being watched by some angels, maybe some humans who are already in heaven, definitely by God. So you're already on stage. Get used to it. And in heaven, when you're finally, you know, installed as king over your kingdom, everybody's going to be watching you. So if you've had a lifetime of practice doing it down here, by the time you get up there, it'll be, oh, okay, because you'll have learned to love it. But he's, what he's busy getting across is heaven is an awful lot like what's down here, except that you enjoy it. Because the sin... The sin nature is removed. Without a sin nature, then all the struggle and the effort and the differentials between you and everybody else becomes a source of enjoyment rather than a source of, of upset. It's not that there isn't any upset. There is upset and there is struggle, but it's always resolved um, in a satisfying way. That's what he. That's what he's stressing. I mean, because it's real clear that the angels, you know, in scripture, it's real clear that the angels are still struggling. It's real clear that the angels have, as it were, um, discomfort. It's not so much whether you have temporary discomfort; it's whether you get meaning out of it. The value of life is the meaning you get out of life. Not whether it feels good or feels bad. And that makes sense because if perfection as defined by God is really full spectrum rather than nice, then if you're getting the meaning that you want out of it, the fact that it doesn't feel nice being intrinsic to the meaning that you get, then it shouldn't feel nice. You see? And it isn't going to be nice. When you got all those people at the bottom, the perennial peasant, you know, drooling over your every move so they can learn something, because that's the only way they're willing to learn, is by watching some human higher than them, like they do now. That's not a happy state of affairs. But it's a satisfying state of affairs if it works. Because, hello, the cockroaches of society are at the bottom. They know they're cockroaches. They know they're at the bottom. They'll be the first to tell you in the heavenly state how they are cockroaches and they are at the bottom. And God is just for doing that. And they'll be happy to say that. And it will be true. And it will be satisfying that they get a little more, a little more, a little more. And eventually, I'm thinking, there will be a middle class, spiritually. Because how else is it going to go? So, you know, I, I think I finally, if I've missed anything in Integrated Wise... of, you know, significance. I'll do another audio on it, but I think this finishes 
the topic for now.